Judy, I'd love, I'd love for you to just tell me about how you came into this, because, um, or maybe to set it up, I'll tell you how I came across your album. Oh yes, that would be interesting to know. Yeah, I, I just was, I've, I've, I've been a fan of Timothy Cummings for years now. Um, in fact, that same friend I was telling you about, he had, he had come across one of Tim's books of original tunes called An Ift of Efts, and that's, uh-huh. that's where we started, sort of becoming. Uh, <laughs> fanboys of, of Tim's work. And, uh, yes. and, and so as, as we kind of, we, I'm coming at this from, from great Highland pipes. Um, yes. I started playing Highland pipes when I was a teenager. And, and so it's only in the more recent years that I've got a set of small pipes and really love playing them. And I started to imagine like, well, what if a person could sing with them? And then I came across some videos of Tim and I already knew his name of him at, uh, at some, some uh, small piping events where people were doing pipe singing? Or what would you call it? Do you call it pipe singing? Um, uh, we call it pipe and song. We tend to call it pipe and song across here. Well, I think you probably have the correct name because I'm just pulling that out of a hat here. I'm just trying to guess <laughs> it what it would be called. So. so I came across some videos of people doing pipe and song, and, and I was just hungry for more because all I could find was YouTube clips, one of which, one of which was you doing a... Uh, doing, uh, um, I think it was Maggie Lauder. At, uh, Maggie Lauder, and that was at um, uh, now. Yes, I, I know that. I it was know some event. You're talking about. It was yes, in, in front of right. a very fancy fireplace. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Which and that I just I loved that song. I looked up the lyrics because, to be frank, I could not understand them. <laughs> you know. No, uh, no. Uh, and so I looked them up and fell in love with it even more. And I was just I was hungry for more. And that's when I started googling around. Like, surely someone has put together some kind of album. And that's when I found. The Chanter's Weave, which was the album that you put out of uh, Pipe and Song, and uh, I, I love it. So I now, so with that little bit of setup of how I fi- found you, tell me how did you get to the point where you recorded an album doing Pipe and Song? Well, it, it's it's a it's it, for me it, it was a lovely journey because um, I first I first started singing with pipes w- without playing them actually um, because we moved to Scotland thirty two years ago. Um, but before we moved here, I was I was singing and playing in a, um, a, just a, a local a local folk band in in Bath where we used to live. And um, <laughs> Judy and I I don't mean to interrupt you, but I I will make myself vulnerable here and admit to you that Bath Somerset right Yes, that's right. Bath is a place that for me as a very I have not traveled outside of the North American continent, but for me Bath just like. Uh, Rivendell and Narnia is a place that exists only in British literature. And so, <laughs> so for me, Bath means Jane Austen's heroines going to walk and take the waters. So finding out that you've lived in Bath is somewhat magical for me, just right from the beginning. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. Yes, I mean, I, I went to university at Bath, um, awesome. in Bath. And, and um, so I, I, we, were there, we were there for some years. Um, I met my husband there and, and we married whilst we were living there and we, we stayed there for a number of years. And we both, um, whilst I was brought up in a, um, a family, my, my, my father's an organist and, and choir master, so I was brought up with classical music and choral singing um, very much as, as the, the musical background of my life. Um, and when I met Mike and did what you know young young adults do and went out to pubs and um, there were lots and lots of pubs in in Bath at that time who were who had folk, live folk music and to be really honest with you Jim that was the first time I'd really heard folk music um, because as I say my background was sort of classical and choral I see. and I just fell in love with the spontaneity of it. I just loved the, the fact that you could re-sing songs. I was so used to sort of practicing music and you played it and you played it for a concert and you sang it for a concert and then you learned something else. Mm. And I loved the fact that you know you could hear a song that you liked and you could sing it one week and then you could sing it the next week and then you could sing it the next week. Yeah. And, and I, I just loved that spontaneity of so, folk music. Sometimes depending on the crowd you might sing it more than once in one night, huh? Well yes, that's, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. And um uh, and I guess, really, we, we, we both, Mike and I, started to enjoy folk music and picked up a few folk instruments. And well, you know, I, I picked up the guitar and played it very badly, but I started singing to the guitar. But in the folk band that we played in, um, there was a, a lovely chap called Henry Ford who 
um, played the Northumbrian pipes. And he had a couple of songs that he sang with them, um, that he sang in unison with, with his pipes. And he just sort of speculated one day, it would be nice to, if you could sing with this, because you've got a nice strong voice. Oh, so, you, so start... you could compete with that, that, that sort of strong tone of the Northumbrian pipes, yeah? So you could yes, along that's with right. It. I see, I see. And um, so I, I, started, I started sort of doing a couple of arrangements with Henry. And not long after we started exploring this, and I was really loving it, loving the experience, um, we actually had to move to Scotland. Mike got a job up here and um, we moved. And I said to Mike, well, I'm obviously going to have to find a Northumbrian piper in Scotland um, because I knew nothing really about pipes other than Northumbrian pipes. Those were the first pipes that I'd come across. That's so fun so, because for, for me personally and for probably any, at least the vast majority of people who will listen to this, my, my friends here, here over here in the States, we all came to pipes through the, the Great Highland Bagpipe, a, a very sort of you know, very competition circle style of bagpiping. Yes. And so to find some, just, just to hear your experience of coming to piping via Northumbrian pipes, like normally, I don't mean to say normally, but for my, for me personally and for my friends here, Northumbrian pipes are like a footnote that you find on a Wikipedia page years after you started piping, you know? So yes. this, this is fun to hear about. Yes. I, and I mean, obviously, I'd, I'd heard the, the, the Highland Pipes, I mean, I, I knew of them, um, but I didn't really know anything about, in, in any detail, about the pipes. And when we moved here, Mike said to me, well, rather than finding a piper, why don't you buy a, you know, get a set of pipes and learn to accompany yourself? And I thought, oh, that's an, that's an interesting idea, and we didn't have any children, and <laughs> had that's, more time on my hands, and I thought, yeah, <laughs> okay. Sometimes um, a necessary prerequisite to get and learn pipes, right? <laughs> if you haven't got absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, time is is, is important. Yeah. Um, and so I actually went to I actually booked myself into um, a folk uh, weekend in Darlington, actually in the northeast and um, of England, because they were having um, a, a a sort of um, a beginners class for Northumbrian pipes. What I didn't realise was actually it was a whole piping weekend and there were all sorts of pipes being played and, and taught at that weekend. Mm. So I did the, I did the sort of North, a day playing the Northumbrian pipes and I got on reasonably well. At the end of the day, I actually could, I don't know, play Frere Jacques or something like that on the, on the Northumbrian pipes and I, could, and I could sort of hum along to it mm. and felt, oh, actually, this is okay. And then in the evening, the, all the tutors gave a master class concert. And that's when I heard Hamish, Hamish Moore, who came to teach the Scottish small pipes. And I heard him playing his pipes. And I thought, oh, those are the pipes I want to sing with. Mm. They, I just, I absolutely fell in love with the flow of them. Um, it just felt so, they felt so much more natural for singing with somehow than the Northumbrian pipes. Mm. Um, and uh, so I, I went and spoke to him afterwards and he said, yes, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to talk to you more about this. He said, but I live in Dunkeld. And I said, mm, well, we live in Dunfermline. <laughs> mm. And uh, so we struck up a, a friendship and I went up to his workshop in Dunkeld and we discussed what I wanted to with the pipes and he had never made a set of pipes for somebody to sing with before so um he he was very excited about it and um at the time he was running a lot of residential piping weekends which were so exciting actually just to go and be with other pipers of varying levels many were at the same kind of beginners level as i was mm. Um, and I learned some basics from Hamish there, but he always knew that I wanted to sing with them. So really from the, the first point of picking up the pipes, I just started singing along with them. Whatever I was playing, I sang. I see. Um, so this was right from the beginning, the two were entwined for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was the purpose of me getting the pipes. And the more I, the more I sang with them, the more I loved not just the... Not just the sort of the, the physical thing, but the, but the, the whole experience. Um, I think I think um, on Chanter Speed in my sleeve notes I've described it, and, and it absolutely felt feels like this when I'm singing with the pipes. I don't know if you've had this, Jim, but 
just, you know, the vibration from the drones and the chanter and my throat when I'm singing, you know, my mm -hmm. vocal cords, just the combination of that. It feels as though I'm in the middle of an organ. And I don't know whether I made that association because of my, my, my father's a, an organist, but I just, I, I absolutely loved the sensation. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and really, it, it took off from there and I started singing a couple of songs. I think the first song I learned was The Recruited Collier. Um, because that was one of the ones that I'd been working on with Henry. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll do that one first. Tell me a little bit about that tune and then continue the story for me. Well, the recruited Collier, is, it's just, it, it's basically, I think it's a Victorian. I think it was written in Victorian times and it's just basically about a, um, a young man who went and got drunk in the local town and, uh, and uh, was signed up for, for the army. And his sweetheart was distraught at the thought of him leaving and going and joining the army um, and uh, she would much rather that he had been he had been a collier um, and she loved the idea of him hewing the coals and 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 bringing coals home for her to to put on the fire um, and it's just it's just a it's just a a sad song <laughs> in yeah. some ways um, it's rather sort of over dramatic in my view, but it's it's got a lovely lovely chorus to it, and it, um, yeah, I and I and I enjoyed really enjoyed singing it. it I, I agree with you. Like the the subject matter is somewhat sad, but I I have this a very clear memory of the first time I heard you doing this tune because it's the first track on the album, and to that point. I had I had tried a little bit of pipe singing myself, but I really and even still now I can't do much beyond speeding up a slow air a little bit you know like i i it takes a lot of thought and so hearing how much this one moves the pipe part itself as well as yes. the the vocals that it really kind of blew my mind i didn't realize that this kind of movement was possible when i first listened to it it was very exciting for me the first time i listened to this recording thank you that's very kind of you to say so i mean i mean i i i guess i right from the word go i knew that i wanted to harmonize uh, I wanted I wanted to have different uh, you know harmony and and um, top line because um, and I think that comes just from my choral background that I was I'm so used to singing around pe with people around me singing different different um, counter melodies mm. um, that it was a perfectly natural thing for me to, to to try to do on the pipes but when I first performed it um, Hamish encouraged me he heard it and he encouraged me to take it to the Lowland and Border Piper Society annual competition which I I, I was terrified <laughs> I was absolutely terrified yeah. um, and I went and performed it and I can still see Gary West I, I don't know if you're aware of Gary West or have you heard Gary West's playing no but I want every recommendation you can give me so he'll be the oh, next he, I look he's up a, he's a, a wonderful piper I mean he is he came from the Highland Pipes and, and but he's a wonderful small piper as well very 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 talented man um, and uh and I still can still see him. He, he was judging this class, and he sat there with a stony face all the way through. And I thought well, he's hated it. He's absolutely hated it. You know, <laughs> that's a judge's um, job is to give that impression, right? <laughs> absolutely. But the, the the lovely thing about the London Border Piper Society is that they always the judges always have to write a crit for the that that the, the pipers can take away with them at the end. Now tell me and, though, Judy, uh, is is it legible when they write? Is their writing legible? <laughs> Because well, that, that's an issue we run into it with the Western United States Pipe Band Association all the time. They write us a crit, but no one can decipher what they've written. <laughs> what they've put. Um, well, I managed to read this because what he wrote, and I can still remember it, was um, he wrote, I could have listened to this all evening Oh, long. that's lovely. That's great. And that was all he wrote. And I just thought, oh, well, that's, that's good. What's the matter with you, Minas? And where's your darling Jimmy? The soldier boys have taken him and sent him far from me. Last payday he went to town. All but them hard-hearted fellows enticed him in and they got him drunk. Now he's best gone to the gallows. So bring Put me in 
And afterwards, I had a, there was a lot of pipers there who came up to me and said, we've heard a lot of people in this class um, singing with their pipes, but they all sing in unison. Mm. And we've never heard anybody playing harmonies whilst they've been singing. So that made, it, and a couple of people said to me, you really should start, you should, really should record what you've done. And I said, well, I've only done one or two songs, so I'm, I'm not really in a position to do that. <laughs> But as the years went by, um, and I was playing more and more, I was learning more and more songs and arranging more and more songs, um, the society actually said to me, you know what, we think we would like to sponsor you to make a CD. That's um, awesome. Wonderful. Which I'm, was, I'm so which glad was they decided very, to. I mean, it, it, it blew me away, actually. Yeah. Um, I, as well as frighten me, because, you know, like us all, I mean, I had a full-time job and I didn't have masses of time and... Mm. Um, I loved what I did, but the thought of actually standing in front of a microphone and formally recording it was a little bit terrifying. Mm, adds some pressure to it, huh? Yes, it does, very definitely. And I suppose uh, if you have someone sponsoring you to do the CD, then you also have that pressure of what you really want to please them. You don't want them yes. to regret what they've done. Yes, yeah. exactly. But having said that, in the end, and I think that partially it just made me decide that I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't accept, uh, I wouldn't go down the, the idea of sponsorship. I would, I would fund it myself. Mm. simply because I didn't want that pressure mm. and I thought well if it all if it all doesn't work then it's 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 my expense and not anybody else's mm, so I in the end I, I didn't go down that road but actually you know they feature very highly I mean in the sleeve notes and everything because it was there it was them that really pushed me into into making Chanter's Weave um, I'm and, sure glad uh, they did uh, well, yeah, I, I am. I am too. I'm quite. I'm quite proud of it. I mean, it's not perfect. It's. It feels very much like a live performance, which it was. I have to say, when I when I went into the, to to record it, um, Stevie Lawrence, who who was the producer, said to me, "I want you to play the pipeline, and then sing over it. We'll put put another track on top of it." Sure, and he, I looked he, at he it. naturally wants control, right, to be able yes. to manipulate this, yeah. Yes, and I said, I can't do that, Stevie. <laughs> and he said, well, try. 
And you know, Jim, I just couldn't. I couldn't play the pipe part without singing it. Wow. And I couldn't sing it without, without actually my fingers moving on the chanter. That's so interesting. It's, it, it had become such a sort of a, um, an organic experience for me that I couldn't do one without the other. That's and amazing. So, well, it was very inconvenient, I think, for the producer. <laughs> sure, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I've, I've, tried to, I've tried to record, you know, just like little demos for friends and stuff like that before, nothing professionally, just with my sort of hobby equipment and experience. And I can absolutely understand where he's coming from. You want every, you know, if you get a, if you get a four piece quartet in there, you want each one to play their own part individually so you can manipulate volumes yes. and stuff. And so I can understand yes. that, but yes, it, it's fascinating it, to me that for you, the two have been so entwined right from the beginning that they were inseparable. Yes, they are. And in fact, I find it very difficult to sing without my pipes now, even, wow. you know, I, I, I just find it very difficult and I don't know whether, I, I don't know why that is. I, th I think it is because, you know, 20 years I've been, I've been, well, it's longer than that. It's probably 20, 25 years. Um, I've been singing with them, and I, uh, and I, they, they just fit together. And I, I find it really hard to to do one without the other. Mm. Um, but I, but it, it, it was a, it was a, a wonderful experience to do. It really, really pushed me to try to perfect songs and get them to as good as they should be. Um, it didn't always achieve that, but hey ho. You know, no. it, it is what it is. It, and it's, it is. It's and a what it is. So yeah, I absolutely. I'm proud of that. And it's, it's charming for that fact as well. Um, is, did, do you remember what his microphone setup roughly was? Did he have like a mic on your drones, one on your chanter, one on your voice? Or was it more yes, like, he did. I see, I yes. see. Yes, he did. Um, I had to stand very still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. That was probably a challenge with the bellows as well, huh? Yeah, absolutely, do, do absolutely. You, I'm trying to remember from that video I saw. Do you normally rest the bellows on your on your arm or up on your shoulder or uh, where do you? No, I like to, I like them to come up over my shoulder because I like to have them in my ear. Oh, I see, um, I see. Uh, so they tend they tend to sort of come up over my shoulder. Yeah, that probably yeah. holds them a bit more steady for the microphone as well. So that's yes. probably good. Yes. So, so yeah. I had wondered before we started emailing if you had come to this as a piper first or as a singer first. Um, because personally, I'm a piper first for sure. I don't have a very, I'm not very confident with my singing, nor do I. My, my, my singing range basically matches a chanter's range. <laughs> it's basically exactly <laughs> an octave. Well, mine isn't much more, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you've unraveled the mystery for me a bit. And like, as I listen to the album, there, there is at least one track that you do that is solo vocals without pipes, right? The, um, yes. The very sad song that makes me cry every time Motherless I listen to child. it. Child. Yes, goodness. Yes. That's a... That's a, I mean, very good song. Very, very sad. It really does get to me every time. Um, so you've unraveled that a bit. And it's, it's, fast, it's a fascinating insight for me to think of you at, with a sort of choral mindset. You know, like if you're singing yes. in a choir, I'd imagine you're very accustomed to hearing all the other parts at least as much as you are hearing what's coming out of your own mouth. That's, that's absolutely true. Yes. And that's absolutely the case. Um, I think that's why I, I, I found it so easy, really, to, mm -hmm. to harmonise whilst I was singing. It, 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 I mean, I have to say, Jim, you know, um, I had to lock myself away in a room when nobody was home quite often mm. to play around with some of the harmonies because, you know, it doesn't always come, you know, <laughs> very, very um, naturally. You know, sometimes I had, to really, I had to really work on it hard. Yeah. Um, and decide whether I felt that that harmony worked or not. Mm. Um, it's very easy to fall into the trap of always using thirds. Um, yeah. And that's why I kind of wanted to, to uh, explore a little bit more about count, sort of actually it's almost like playing a, a, a counter melody rather than just using the occasional harmonic um, the, the occasional harmony note well, that, here and there. That absolutely comes through. And I, that's why I was curious, As you, do you remember from that, have you continued playing guitar, by the way, or was that just for no, a brief time? No, I'm afraid it sits in, my, it sits in the cupboard downstairs, I'm afraid. Well, it's, that's all right. Um, I, I'm just curious if you feel that, um, like, I think that trying to sing along with guitar is probably an experience that a relatively large number of people have had. You know, a lot of us have tried yes. to do that. And I'm curious if you feel like, um, you know, playing guitar while you sing, your guitar is accompanying your singing. Do you feel that maybe rather than your pipes accompanying your voice, it's more like the two are singing a duet? Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's why I called the CD Chanter's Weave, because it, that's exactly what it feels like. It really does feel like we are, the, our voices are in duet together. Absolutely. Yes. Mm. Well, this um, is, that's an exciting insight just for me personally, because I've, I've struggled with this. I, I mean, I'm, I'm in love with this idea of singing while playing the pipes. Um, no, I doubt that I'll, I would ever uh, be able to achieve what, you, what you've achieved with it, but it's so fun for me to just, exactly as you say, I shut myself away in my tiny office and I just do it for the joy of it. And yes. I have wondered, like, hmm, is, 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 the, is, my, is my voice accompanying the bagpipes? Are the pipes accompanying my voice? I had never really stopped to think, no, the chanter and my voice are singing together. Yes. That's interesting. And, and I think that that's definitely the way to think. And, and keep persevering, Jim, because honestly, um, I've, I've come, come out with some horrendous sounds <laughs> <laughs> when I've been working on arrangements. Um, and in fact, when I did She Moved Through the Fair, um, I was determined to try and get some... Um, sort of ethereal type feel at the end of the end of it when when the you know the ghost of, of his his dead love comes back to him um and i i just i i don't know if it was brave or foolish but i just decided i'd put some some sort of discords in there at the end against my voice which i actually is thrilling to sing and and hold a, a note against a discord on the pipes it's it's mm. a very sort of thrilling sound um, but I, I think it, I think it worked okay. Um, it's it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I I think it, it achieved what I wanted it to achieve. It works amazingly well, Judy. I that's she moved to the fair is the only tune that I've ever like worked to the point where I felt confident doing some form of recording. I did yeah. a I did a version of it for a local art show last year. And Lovely. And it Were was you a, singing with us as well? I did, I did. And, oh, good. And it was fun. And I, you know, I'm relatively happy with it just because it's so hard to do. But the thing is, I was listening to your arrangement and looking at Tim's as well. Tim has an arrangement of it as well. And uh-huh. basically, I basically, if I didn't copy you exactly, I was definitely drawing a lot from you. But from your, the first and second verse, when it got to how you record that last verse... I love it, but I could not begin to replicate it. Like, it's just amazing. And I definitely would like to play it here in this interview for sure, because I want people to go to the album and listen to that one a million times. That last oh, verse. That's very, that's very kind of you. Well, like, it's, yes, like, it's mean, like you say, it's easy to fall into the problem of just going with thirds or even just yes. droning while you sing. And, but man, that counter melody, that, that dissonance, that's, it is amazing. I find it, it's, it's like orally delicious. Oh, that's very kind of you, Jim. Mm. Thank you. Mm. I, I, that's, that's lovely of you to say that because that's, that's what it felt like as well, I have to say. Mm. Vocally, it felt delicious. That's well, a, good. Good, a good description. Well, then we're going to play it right here, and I would invite the listeners to enjoy all of it, but pay close attention to that last, that last verse and just what happens between the voice and the chanter there.
Um, another of my absolute favorites on there is the Mingale Boat song. Yes. And I don't mean yes. to come across as if I've been questioning your abilities, Judy, but both the last verse of She Moved Through the Fair and the arrangement of Mingale Boat Song did make me wonder, not that it would be any detriment to you, but I did wonder, like, hmm, I wonder if she can actually play this and sing at the same time, just because the Mingale Boat Song's pipe part is so, it moves so much, while the yes. voice doesn't move directly with it, you know, in perfect thirds or something like that. Um, yeah. Tell me about the Mingale Boat Song. Well, it's a song that I've been, I, I, I learned at school, and, um, and I, I, I love it. I think it's a, a beautiful song. Um, I, until I sort of did it for the CD, um, I hadn't really, to be honest with you, looked into the history of it, and I did realise that it wasn't a particularly old song. Um, but I, I really wanted to use the pipes to emulate the movement of the sea, the sort of the waves, and, um, and that was what I was trying to achieve with the, the pipe accompaniment for that. Um, and... Again, it was one of those sort of lock, locking yourself in a room and, and just trying different ways of, of doing that. And, and and I again, it's one of those things that it is. It's it's 
it's a vocal it's a, it's, a, it's a vocal challenge to to hold on to the tune whilst I'm doing what's happening on on the pipes but mm -hmm. I have to say yes I mean I, I do do it live like that that is how I do it live um, I've simplified it a little bit more it, when I play it along with people who I know are going to sing along mm. for example um, when I I play with the Royal P Scottish Piper Society um, they they do two concerts a year at the Edinburgh Fringe um, and they always ask me to go and, and play with them. Um, but I know that they are great singers there, and um, so I, tr I tend not to do quite so much of the counter-harmony on that because um, uh, I, f I feel I need to concentrate on getting them to sing along. <laughs> oh, I see, but, I see. When I, but when I'm playing it totally solo, yes, I, 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 I make that movement. I, I really wanted to, this, to just get the swell and, and, of, of, of the waves in it it has that feeling absolutely yes. it, it the first time i listened to it, i thought well this sounds like a sea shanty you know it definitely yes. definitely had that feel and is is are the edinburgh fringe concerts the ones where you, you you told me that well you're often the only uh woman there performing you're also often the only one wearing trousers that's absolutely true yes <laughs> i told my <laughs> wife that <laughs> It was just an observation that Mike made one year. Um, I, I think I've been there. I've been doing this for quite a number of years now, probably six or seven years. And um, I think after the second year, Mike said to me, I just noticed, he said, you're the only woman playing in the whole concert, and yet you're the only one wearing trousers. That's so nice. <laughs> because everybody else is in kilts, um, uh, which kind of tickled me a little bit. I thought yeah. that was quite funny. Yeah, I told my wife that. She said, that's a great line. I hope that she uses that at every opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, well, it, but they, they, they particularly love the, the Mingle Boat song. They always ask me to sing it there. Yeah, that's, that's one that I've, I asked my wife and my sister-in-law to learn the vocals just following your recording and uh, so I could play the pipes along with, because I have no chance really of singing and playing that one, but I, I love it very much. And so uh, we're going to do that Is that, that one of the ones that Tim is in Tim's book? Uh, yeah, it is, is. It is. Yeah, that's it one is. that you're yes, singing for Tim. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yes, Yes. Uh, interestingly, I'm just going to put this in. Um, I don't know whether you, uh, I, when I was listening to you talking to Tim, um, and he was saying that one of his pi sets of pipes came from Nigel Richard in um, in East Lothian. I think that's um, right. Yeah. I don't know whether whether you knew um, Jim, but uh, Nigel died and, and very sadly on New Year's Day. Oh, I. You know, I actually did see that in one of the small that. piping oh. Facebook groups. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. Which is it really was, too bad. He was a very, he was a lovely guy, a really lovely guy. And he'd been making sets since, what, the yeah. 80s, I think? He's been, yeah. he's made a lot of sets of pipes. A lot of people play his pipes. Yes, they do. They do. And they're very good pipes. And it's really interesting. He wasn't particularly interested in being a piper himself, but um, he, he made beautiful pipes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a lovely instrument maker. Sorry, I just thought I'd mention that in case no, any of your listeners didn't know. That's definitely worth mentioning. Absolutely. He deserves to be mentioned and often. So. Yes, he's a lovely guy. Yeah. He was. In fact, I remember, and this is another. This is another sort of an annual competition. I think when I pl first performed Maggie Lauder at the LBPS competition, mm -hmm. Nigel was the chairman of the society, and I announced it rather. I think it uh, rather sort of um, warily saying, "I think this song is full of double entendre." <laughs> yeah. And. <laughs> And uh, Nigel came up to me after and he said, there is absolutely no doubt that it's full of double <laughs> entendre. Don't be any doubt about that at all. He said, it's full of it. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. So uh, on that note, I really, I, I actually, pull, I have the lyrics for that tune pulled up right here so I can look at them. And I don't know, I don't know enough about the sort of the etymology of these, would you call them dialects? Um, I feel like as, yeah. I, as I read through this, it's it's like reading Robert Burns' poetry for me, at least. Yes, like yes, I... it is. It, it is in the Scots. I have to say, when I recorded it, um, uh, I wasn't. I don't think I'd really got my tongue around a lot of the a lot of the, the way of, of saying some of the words, mm. um, and uh, uh, I was I was put right a few years later. Oh, were by, you put um, right? <laughs> <laughs> by a, a, a proper Scot, Scotswoman, Annie Grace, who's, who's a lovely singer and piper. And she, she went through it with me and she, she showed me how to make the right pronunciations. So I sing it slightly differently now. I see. But um, it is slightly anglicised in, in the version that I sing. 
but uh, yes, it's 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 all the you know um, uh, you know I'll shake my foot with right goodwill if you'll blow up your chanter. You know, and it's, <laughs> there's, so, there's so many great lines in it. <laughs> there are absolutely. I, I, I love that at the, toward the beginning she says, uh, "Jog on your gate, you bladder skate." <laughs> yes, exactly. Skate. That's a great yeah. word. And yeah. it even it even evokes the image of a bagpiper, you know, bladder skate even. Yes, um, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, um, yeah. I I think it's it's a it's a fun song, and in fact, um, one of the reasons why I I started working on it was because Thomas, my son, who'd heard me, you know, singing and practicing in the early days, and was was you know. In fact, I started playing the pipes when I was pregnant, and I thought he's going to love the pipes because he's oh, heard yeah, them. Sure. <laughs> but he hates them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't say he hates them, but he, it, they're not his favourite instrument. Let's say I he, see, he's yeah. very musical himself, but he doesn't. He doesn't. Not that fussy maybe, about the pipes. Maybe he got enough of them in those. Uh, I think he, <laughs> in those first I think he did. I think that chanter just went through my tummy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, he he said to me, "Oh, stop doing slow, miserable songs, Mum. Sing something that's a bit more cheerful." <laughs> So I, I I suddenly remembered Heather showing me this song. I thought, oh, I'm going to have a go at this. Yeah, and this is uh, a great tune. Just like you say, there's definitely some double entendre going on here. Oh, definitely. So Without many a doubt. great, hilarious phrases. So anybody listening, it's worth looking up the lyrics just to read through along. Uh, it's hilarious. 
did we did we talk about the invalid regiment that's the one that you wrote right yes yeah now, I, that that's a, a song which I, I i i have a particular fondness of it actually partially because it i was able that was one where i did what well, was double tracking the voice mm -hmm. i didn't I, I played it with the pipes live and then we put some more harmony vocal harmonies over the top oh of that. i see yeah yeah um because i wanted it to sound slightly choral i think that i wanted to just get that little bit of my my background into it um but yeah, I mean that that grew out of um, going to uh, <laughs> Thomas's school was very seriously when he was in primary school. He they were very seriously into projects. They had projects for everything, and one of his projects had to be he had to do a Scottish castle. So and did you, uh, as a parent, ever kind of wish like could we do a, a could we cut down the projects just a bit? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Because <laughs> it's I not mean, it's know. not just Thomas who does the project, right? It's oh it's... <laughs> no. In fact, yesterday we we we, we do a, a local a Zoom quiz with with a group of local friends, and one of the questions was about the Vikings, and I said, "Oh no, that's taking me right back to making that Viking ship when uh, Thomas was at primary school." <laughs> <laughs> More like your second time through primary school, vicariously through Thomas, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And we thought, oh, cracky! And it had to sail. It had to. It had to float. It had to sail. Think, oh, wow, they were serious. <laughs> are, are they joking? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Thomas, what? So Thomas chose to do his project on Blackness Castle, which actually I have to say I knew nothing about. Which is is a um, a castle that's along the um, on the shores of the Forth, um, and um, it's it's called the the ship that never sailed mm. because if you have a there, there are some pictures of it which look just like the bow of a ship um, on the on the sort of uh, promontory of the of the land mm. and um, and that kind of sort of tickled me a little bit when I thought oh that's a quite an interesting sort of phrase um, and then we went to 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 the castle and we went into the tourist shop to um, as such as it is to get um, a tourist guide, you know, a, a guide to the castle so that Thomas could use that as we were walking around. Sure. And the curator there, a lovely guy, um, he said, um, oh, he said, you're doing a project on Blackness Castle. And Thomas says, yeah. He said, well, I've got some really, really new uh, research that you can add to, into that. That would make it really special. And he took us to a bridge that we walked across um, to get to the castle. And there were some stones there with... Um, uh, a carving on it, which basically said 1796, P J Dow, and then I eight R S B seven. And he said, "What do you think that is?" And Thomas said, "Oh, I don't know." I said, "Well, is 1796 a date?" He said, "Yeah, it is." But he said, "I have been looking at this for years and, not, and just trying to work out what this all was." And he did some research, and he found out that it actually was car must have been carved by um, James Dow, who he found out with, through lots of research was a surgeon. So he, th he at first he thought that the P stood for private, private mm -hmm. James Dow, but he then found out that it actually means practitioner James oh, Dow, see. who was a surgeon, um, and he'd put his his um, regimental number there. And the I stands for the Invalid Regiment, which was um, uh, the people, the, the, the soldiers who were too old or um, uh, injured to go back to war. So they basically stayed at the castle, which at that time was a prison. And, um, and it, was, it was, you know, looking after prisoners of war. So the, the people who were too old or, or too injured to go back to war basically became jailers <laughs> in the castle. I see. And um, the whole sort of thought of that sort of tickled my fancy a little bit. And I thought, I'm going to try and write something about this. So I wanted to sort of evoke the idea of James Dow, you know, suspicious, you know, even being a surgeon at war in those days must have been a horrific thing. Oh, sure. Sawing off people's yeah. legs, you know, to, to avoid gangrene and all the rest of it must have been pretty horrendous. Um, and he was now standing back and watching others go to war, probably marching nice and proudly, you know, yeah. um, with perhaps rose-tinted glasses about what their experience was going to be like. And I thought that's, that's quite a nice sort of anti-war theme that I could, I could work on. Now, um, the, your description of the Invalid Regiment changes the way that I had been listening to it. I've always liked the song, but I had read it as the Invalid 
regiment. Ah. As if it was a, a regiment of, of rebels or a regiment of people who were doing it only because they had to, but they didn't want to, etc. Right. So this explanation has shifted that a bit for me in a very interesting way. Yes, yes, it is literally the invalid regiment, the, 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 the people who are too sick or injured yeah. to, to go back to war. They have to stay behind. So um, yeah, I, I just it came quite easily actually, and uh, and did you and write I quite it? Enjoyed was it precisely it. was it precisely with doing it as a pipe as a pipe song in mind right from the beginning? Yes, I see. Yeah, very definitely. And when you when you go through that process, do you maybe there's maybe it's not the same every time, but I'm curious. Did you do you feel like the words came to you first and the music followed, or the other way around, or was it kind of all together? I think the words. Some of the words came. Yes, yeah, the words started to come I mean I didn't have the whole song mm -hmm. but I had a few a few lines which I liked and I again you know lock, locked room and all that <laughs> yeah. um I just sat and I played around with some some melodies and um and I thought yeah look, this will work mm -hmm. and thereafter it it developed more it, it, sort of the song the, the words developed with the melody mm -hmm. I think I started with I started with some 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 key lines but then the, the melody came and started sort of dictating the rest of the song. 
I see. So, so with this and with other, uh, you know, with other songs where you've done, you know, arrangements of, of an existing, you know, folk song, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, is that, is that usually your process that it's more, more a process to sit down and just kind of play and see what happens? Or do you ever sit yes. down with pen and paper first? Oh, no, there's never any pen and paper involved. Gotcha. gotcha. In fact, that was, that was, that was probably when, when Tim asked me if he could include the Mingle Boat song in his book, that was a bit scary because I thought, oh, I've got to put this to music now. I mean, I can write, you know, I, I, I can read music and I, and sure. I can write notes, but... Um, it was only uh, at that point that you thought, I've got to write it down. Yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> up until that point, it's all in my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so when you so no, in, there's when you... no pen and paper involved. It, it, it is very much, very much a sitting down and playing around. So then, um, Judy, when, when you went in to record this album... Did you take any notes with you, or were you just walking in like, yep, I'm ready to do this entire album, let's do it? No, I didn't take any notes with me at all. Wow. Um, uh, and except for, there was one song, Welcome the Stranger, I think it was. Mm. There was one line in that, even though I'd written it, um, that I couldn't, um, I, I just couldn't get in my head. Oh, I so see. I did take the words in for, for Welcome the Stranger, but everything else was done without, without anything. Now yeah. there's there's another tune in here that um, that did catch my 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 interest right off the bat, uh, which was an existing tune called the Terror Time. Yeah. Um, I was I've been familiar with the 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 music the melody of this tune for for years and years because w- when I was first getting into bagpiping, I listened to the Wicked Tinkers quite a bit. I don't know if you've heard of the Wicked Tinkers over there. No, I don't think I have. They're a California-based group that uh, their lead piper, Aaron Shaw, is an excellent an excellent piper, um, and he gets together with some, basically some crazy men with drums and somebody who can play didgeridoo really well. And, oh, uh, fantastic. And they just run around making really exciting and fun kind of insane music. Yeah, um, I'll have but, to look for those. Yeah, they're, they're great. And one, one of their early albums, though, he had... Um, Sort of a, you know, sort of a, you know, they have crazy songs and then they'll have kind of a calm song where, he, where he'll play an, an air or something, you know. And he played the Terror Time just as a, as a Highland Pipe solo. And I liked the melody so much. And so I learned it and it's always been one of my favorites. I play it often at funerals and stuff where I don't usually tell the, the customer that it's called the Terror Time because that doesn't no. really sound great, right? But, but it's, it's a great melody for that kind it's of occasion. It's a beautiful melody. Yes, it so, is. But all these years of being familiar with the, the melody and loving it, I had no idea that there were lyrics set to it. Yeah. And I didn't have any idea what it was about either. And so it was only when I encountered it on your album that I was like, now what is this about? And that's, honestly, I didn't even know about the Travelers. No, no. Um, I, I was attracted to this song very much so because um, I lived in a, a sleepy sort of English county. Or I grew up in a, a sleepy English county in Herefordshire. And um, uh, I, I, I became very friendly with, with a lad who was, who was from a travelling community. Um, and we didn't see each other very often because obviously it was, when it was just when they were passing through. Mm. But I got a, a real sense of how tough their lifestyle was. Um, you know, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't register with GPs. They couldn't, um, uh, they couldn't get regular work because they were always being moved on. They didn't have any permanent housing and whatever. And whatever people think about travellers, that, that is an undeniable fact, you know. Mm-hmm. And he was a lovely lad and he really introduced me. He really opened my eyes. So I became particularly interested in doing the terror time because it, it's, it really does evoke the, the, the struggle that, that they have, yeah. you know, um, with, with having to do sort of seasonal work and then move on and find more, more work elsewhere. Um, it's, and, and really, and really experience quite a lot of animosity from, from local people when they move around the country. Yeah. Um, that, there's that line in there about when you, I, I, I'm not going to really quote it perfectly, but something about when you, when you desire the closeness of humankind and you move yeah, toward a when town. You need the, when you need the, the warmth of your own humankind. That's right. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, it, it, it's 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 a it's it's a sign of the times. I mean, it's it's very interesting because I I, I trained as a social worker, um, and indeed I'm still very involved in social work. Um, Do you think that that early experience with that young boy might have had any effect on your on your interest to to have gone into social work? Um, I think it I think it did. Mm-hmm. I think I've I've always had a a, a feeling that I wanted to. I wanted to make a contribution somehow to other people's lives. I wasn't I wasn't big headed in the sense that I felt that I could change people's lives, but I always felt that I could do something that would um, that anything I could do to help people to have better experiences in their lives would be good. Mm, sure. um, and and a very rewarding experience. And in, in fact, I mean I suppose I was encouraged in that from the fact that my parents encouraged me to go on holidays with um, disabled teenagers, for example, and I would buddy a particular teenager with a particular condition and Mm. help them to have a really good holiday. Um, So I kind of got used to that from quite a young age, and and it felt a very natural way for me to go. Um, Mm. So going into social work felt a very very sort of natural step for me, Um, even though my headmaster at school didn't want me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Inadvisable, there's, huh? <laughs> there's, there's no future in social work. There's no future in social work. Yeah, well, it's one of those fields that a person only does if they're passionate about the work, right? No one gets yeah. rich doing social work. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I and I guess um, I I then got into social work training, and I actually heard a, a really really good um, radio program about the travelling community. Um, which I recorded, and I thought, actually, this sounds so much like Terror Time as well. You know, it, it was all about, you know, people being moved on, mm. not being able to, not even being allowed to move off a motorway to get into a, you know, in, into a local town or anything like that. And and it was it was a really interesting um, recording, which I I then used um, in my social work training, in, in my social care training, mm. as an example of discrimination and whatever. So... So that song has has a particular resonance for me. There's no doubt about it, which is why I tried quite hard to make it a good a good experience of mm-hmm. you know with with the pipes. Yeah, it's an it's an excellent arrangement. Absolutely. Um, do you remember when you first ke- became aware of that song? Um, I it, it wasn't until I came to Scotland. Oh, I it see. It wasn't so it, it was it wasn't something I I hadn't actually heard the song before I came up here. Um, which must have been 32 years ago. And I, I do very clearly remember, I, I, I'm afraid I can't tell you who it was, but in a local folk club in, um, in Edinburgh, in a wonderful little, little pub, um, which had, it was called the, the Wee Folk Club. And um, 
uh, it would only, they could only get about 30 people maximum into the, into the room. Mm. It was a tiny little room. And uh, they, I heard a wonderful version of it being sung there. I can very clearly remember it and thinking, actually, I think that would work on the pipes. Yeah. I think that will work on the pipes. So I just went away and, and, and played around with it. Yeah. As I did with, I mean, this isn't on Chanter's Weave, but another um, song which I, I've really enjoyed during is um, Summertime. From Porgy and Bess, um, oh. <laughs> which is a little bit of an, an unusual one to do with the pipes, but, but, cool. um, but uh, I've really enjoyed singing it. And again, you know, Thomas Thomas played in a in a jazz band with um, with his trombone, and they one of one of the players there I'm in a comma time, and I thought, I think I think I could make that work on the pipes. That's so cool. So I started. You know, I went back into my locked room and started playing around with it. And I haven't recorded it, but I would like to. Um, I hope you will. Before I end my days. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a favorite of my in-laws. My mother-in-law used to sing it, uh, and my, my, my wife sings it now. It, I'd, I'd love to hear oh, how you lovely. do that on pipes. That's awesome. Well, why don't you try accompanying her on the pipes? Mm, that sounds scary, but I'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> Do see, try. I'll see how Do long try. she'll tolerate me. <laughs> uh, well, yes, yes, it might be a good idea to be in the locked room for a while first. Yeah, that's right. Get her to get her to record it for you, and then you can. Play there we go. With it. That's the way. <laughs> now, now speaking of getting songs to work on pipes, um, you mentioned that uh, Hamish. Uh, it is Hamish who made your pipes. Is that right? Hamish that's Moore? right. Yes. Uh, yes. You mentioned that you had him put a few keys on there so you could get a few naturals and sharps, etc. Um, yeah. What kind of setup do you have? I think that might be of some interest to the pipers who listen here. Yes, of course, of course. I mean, you know, I, I, I absolutely love my pipes, and, and they sound, I think they sound even better now than they, when, I first, when I first got them. Um, I have, a, I have a, um, a, road, a hardwood chanter, a blackwood chanter, and Hamish felt that I should have softer drones than a hardwood chanter, so he gave me rosewood drones. Um, and I have, at the moment, I have two A's, a tenor D, and... Um, I, I did have 2D drones, but I've actually tuned my top drone, my top D drone up to an E. Um, oh, and that actually features in Terror Time. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the, the songs which I, I use that in. Because um, it just gives another, again, it's that sort of resonance that, that an E gives. So I've got a little bit of um, variety in my drones that I can use. Um, and after I'd been playing the and singing with the pipes for a while, I went back to Hamish and um, and I said, I would really, really like a C natural um, mm. down the bottom. And if possible, I would I would really like a um, an F natural. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because the F sharp is what you would have. Yeah, that's already. right. And I yeah. really wanted the, sort of those two in particular. And when, when I went to see Hamish, I mean, this this is just... He lived. He lived at that time. He lived in Dunkeld, which was a lovely, beautiful little Scottish village, and um, uh, he lived in a lovely cottage. And I walked in, and he uh, walked into his kitchen, and there was Rod Rod Patterson sitting there from Easy Club, mm. who was great friends with Hamish. And they were sitting around the table, and Hamish said, "Oh, come in, Judy, come in." And and you know, there was a, a, a bottle of whiskey on the table, and um, no, Mike and I sat down. Necessary, and, right? Uh, that that, Absolutely. That, I mean, that I mean uh, it's, it goes, sounds right? so <laughs> in, enchanting, but it really was like this. And I yeah. mean, I was just totally bowled away by the whole ex the, the, the whole experience of meeting Hamish. And he is so, so much into his pipes. Mm -hmm. um, and just with Hamish's experience of pipes and what can be achieved on the pipes and Rod's experience of singing, he played, he sang and played guitar, but he, he was a fantastic singer. And with me knowing kind of the kind of thing that I wanted, the three of us were just chatted and, and decided that we would get these. That Hamish said, "Yes, I can get you. I can get you a hole at the back of the the, the chanter, um, which will give you a C natural, mm -hmm. and um, I can give you a, a keyed a keyed um, note up for for the F natural." Mm -hmm. And he actually did put a G sharp on as well, but I I, um, I don't really use that. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I don't use it a lot. It's, it's not been as useful as I thought it might be. Sure. Um, but I, I, I and, and when he made my pipes originally, he, he persuaded me to have gold um, ferrules, or, or gold, gold um, 
connections. Mm -hmm. And yeah. do you know, every time I see Hamish, she says, you've been polishing your gold, Judy. I said, no, <laughs> I don't polish it at all. And he said, but it looks so good. And I said, it's never been polished, Hamish. <laughs> <laughs> So he's, he's very proud of that. He's very proud of that. But no, they're, they're a beautiful set of pipes, and I, I just love, love playing them. And they are, it is your pipes that feature on the cover of the, of the album, right? Yes, I, it I is. I yes. it must be. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And have you, have you been, remained entirely satisfied with the small pipes, or have you at any point thought, you know, maybe I will go back and try some Northumbrian or some other variety no. of pipes? No. I mean, I, I love hearing really, really competent Northumbrian pipers. They, I mean, you know, Catherine to Kell and um, comes, to, comes to mind, but because, because they can achieve, because they're so, they have such dexterity with the notes that they can achieve a real flow. I am not convinced that I would ever have been able to play well enough to get that flow um, that would, would, would sound good with the voice. Mm. Um, uh, and I and I, I have no regrets changing. I mean, I do love the Northumbrian pipes. I think they're a beautiful instrument, but I have no regrets mm -hmm. choosing the Scottish small pipes at all. Well, no, nor do I think you should. I think that it seems like there was some 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 element of fate or destiny that you ended up finding them, and all these things Absolutely. came together to make it happen. Absolutely, yes. I, yeah. I I don't mean to keep you forever, Judy. I, I know it's getting late there, but I'm curious if you have you have you given any thought to the I don't know, you kind of mentioned that, that experience of uh, having what comes from your throat and the drones sort of all harmonizing together, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have heard some people talk about the, the pipes being something like an organ. Um, yes. And, and you mentioned, was it your parents played organ when you were, when you were my, a child? My, my father plays organ, yes. Yeah, he's an organist. Hey, and, did you ever um, play organ yourself? No. But no, you, I, 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 I played piano. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, the organ looked far too. Cold. I mean, when I see my dad playing it, you know. Does he play with his feet the as well? Feet and yeah. the feet <laughs> and the and the the three or four tiers of keyboards and all the hitting the, all those knobs you know, and stoppers. All those knobs and things <laughs> they pull out. I mean, I, I, it's a, it's an incredible instrument, um, and I do love organ music. I have to say, you know, and I've heard dad. You know, obviously, I've heard dad playing. He he played a beautiful organ in. Um, he was organist in in Lempster Priory, and the organ there is is stunningly good it's mm. a beautiful organ and when you know when I used to go after school to get a lift home from him he would be practicing and just walking into this empty church um and hearing dad giving it loudly on the yeah. <laughs> on the organ you know the the, the just again it, it that it really does give me that sensation when I'm playing and singing with the pipes mm. that sort of all-round sort of sense of vibration yeah that it's, rattled it's the a very thrilling kind of feeling yeah it's lovely so I'm curious where, where you've played piano, um, and I don't mean to keep picking your brain, but I'm just curious if you've, if you've thought about this at all. I, I've, I've played a bit of piano myself, and I've, I've, what I've found is that like sometimes once you've got a song down, your mind kind of just follows one thing or the other. It kind of just follows the melody or just the bass line, but the rest of the fingers do what they're supposed to around it. Yeah. When, I, I have to confess I don't play the piano anymore. Well, no worries. Um, no, I, I, Tom, Thomas played the piano to, you know, he, he, he played to quite a good, a good standard. Um, but um, I, I played up to grade five at school, you well, know. But, but you, you just keep doing what you're doing, Judy, because what you're doing is well, excellent. I don't want to... <laughs> no, 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 it's all right. I mean, it, uh, what, what I do think is interesting is I can't just sit down at the piano. The piano is the only instrument I've ever, I've ever learned but I can't sit down and just play it hmm. without music. It's the only instrument I have to have music in front of me to be able to play anything on it. Um, you know, I, I was able to learn mu music by ear on the guitar. I mean, I had a few lessons initially for, for the chords and stuff, but, um, you know, I, I played the recorder at school, but very quickly moved away from using music for that, and I learned everything by ear. Um, I, 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 I prefer to learn tunes on the pipes, by ear, which is why I probably don't play very many sort of fast tunes <laughs> on but the pipes. You, and you also arrange things by ear, you know? That's so interesting. Yes, yeah. Um, like, and I guess so you, some you of clearly that... have this capacity, right, for, for holding on to music because you're able to hold on to these arrangements that you've, that you've worked out. And it's so interesting yeah. that, that sort of the mechanics of one instrument are different than the other. Yeah, and I do think, I mean, I've often said to people when people have asked me about singing and, and harmonizing, and I, I, I do think a lot of that is muscle memory, you know, that kind of 
equates to muscle memory. Mm. As you said about when you when you sing with the piano, um, you know, you, your fingers start doing their own, you know, automatically doing what they're doing. And that must be something to do with muscle memory, that they've, you've practised it and they, they're doing that. And I think some of that is what happens with me with the pipes. If I play it over and over and over again, then... I forget what I'm doing on on the pipes, and I can concentrate on the melody, or vice versa. Okay, so um, and that's that's really what I'm curious about. Do you find that usually your mind is following your chanter or your voice, or is it different for different songs? <laughs> oh, I don't, I, just, I don't know. Or maybe it's I, just all of a one. You know, you're in a zone. You're in some sort of flow, and so maybe it's not. Yeah, easy to I, parse I, it I out. think it is. I mm. think it is a zone. I, I I can't I can't honestly say that I'm consciously thinking about one thing. Or the other. Interesting. Um, they do. They do very much. Sort of. I, I hear them together, and I think that's why I find it really difficult to separate them out. Mm. And that's why you found it difficult to play the pipes on their own and then sing on their own when you recorded the yes. album. It just—it's yes. all one thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's an that is an amazing glimpse, sort of behind the the curtain, as it were, as to how this how you do what you do, Judy. That's really cool. Oh, um, that's that's kind of it's been it's been lovely actually talking about it because it's it's um, uh, it's not something I've really given masses of thought to. Oh, sure, know, yeah. Sometimes it's, you just do it, and it's not until someone asks, right? They actually have to pause yeah. and think. Now, how how does that happen? Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. I would just love to to mention the passing of a queen. Yeah, which was a um, great tune. Tell me all about it. Yeah, I mean, the, the passing of the Queen was was um, shared with me by Gordon Giltrap, who is an amazing and simply an amazing guitarist. He's worth looking up and having a listen to. His beautiful guitar is quite unique style. And his name, um, his name again? Gordon Giltrap. Okay, Gordon Giltrap. And I'm trying to remember. Um, I'm trying to pull up the album right now. Is this is the last tune on the album? Is that right? This is the last tune on the album. That's right. right yes, and it hasn't got pipes on it. I, mm. I did try and arrange it with pipes, but. I think because it is such a, a soft song, I, uh, the pipes didn't feel right with it somehow. Sure, sometimes they're a bit too harsh, I understand Yes, that. Yeah. And, and I, so we dropped the pipes. Um, but um, I really wanted the cello in. I, I love mm -hmm. the cello. I think it's a beautiful instrument. Um, and so Stevie um, found Wendy Weatherby for us, which was, which was really fantastic. It was a real... It was a real um, find and she very kindly played the, the cello on it for me but this was a song that Gordon wrote and I don't think he's written lots of songs um I, at the time I thought it was his only song he told me afterwards that it wasn't he has written some others but um uh he he said I think this would work well with with your voice and perhaps the pipes Judy and he he asked me if I'd do an arrangement for it um and uh, I just love the story I mean I, I don't know which queen it is um, but it's basically, I, I suspect it's one of Henry VIII's wives um, being be <laughs> beheaded. That, that's um, interesting. I hadn't thought about that. That that I think that fits. That makes sense. <laughs> yes. I mean, I don't know if Gordon really, uh, Gordon said he didn't really have any particular queen sure. in mind. But, um, you know, it, it, it was around those, that sort of, those sort of Tudor times when wives were discarded and very sadly yeah. um, at a whim. And, uh, and there was just something about the tune of it and... Um, and I, and I, I, I wanted this sort of the counter melody. It, it worked so much better on, on the, on the, the cello than it did on the pipes. So I was quite happy with how it turned out. But it was interesting because Hamish then, uh, uh, Gordon then um, sent me a recording of somebody who, a number of years ago, had had sung it and recorded it for him, um, which was totally different. It had mm. a totally different feel to it. But he said to me, I could see this being part of a drama, a BBC drama. <laughs> he said. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And now's the time for that, too. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, I, and I guess that's probably um, the, only, the only other one that we could, perhaps, we could perhaps talk a little bit about was the Sally Gardens. Oh, um, yeah. Again. Actually, I did want to ask you about that one because the, the Sally Gardens, that's the very first tune I ever learned on Penny Whistle back when I was like 11 years old. And, yep, it's, and it's, it was... an, it's another one, Judy, that I am amazed by how wonderfully the chanter moves while the voice is moving in a more... St I don't know how I'm trying to yes. describe this. It, there's a steady voice and the chanter is just hopping around. I love that. Yes, yes. I mean, I, again, it, it, it's a song that I... Again, it's, it's a school song that I learned. I sang it sang in the choir at school. And um, 
and found out a little bit more about it, that it's actually about the, um, the Sally Gardens in, um, in Dublin, I think it's Dublin, where there are a lot of willow trees, and of course willow, um, the, the, the Latin name for willow is Salix. So that's, we think I that's see. the derivation of the song. Um, and uh, it's, <laughs> I, I just, I just, yeah, I mean, it's one of the ones I, I, I played around quite a lot with the, with the counter melody for that. Um, but I, I, I quite liked the, the sort of the slight drama of the ending of it. <laughs> Where, that, you know. that's, I was, I was going to let you say your piece about it, Judy, and that is exactly what I was going to say. What really puts a button on it for me is that ending where you're, you're just singing like La La La's, right? And yeah. Do, do, yeah. Do, 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 do. I love that so much. That's right, yeah, yeah. Um, and I just sort of, I just did it in thirds with, with the voice in the pipe. Actually, that's something which I really, I've started doing a lot more in sessions. Um, if I'm if I'm playing a tune with other pipers in the say in the the LBPS, mm. um, that quite often I will start singing the melody or singing a harmony against the against the tune without words, just lying along. Mm. Um, and actually, it's quite interesting because I've seen some other people sort of starting to do the same, which is lovely because. You know, it's encouraging people to sing with the pipes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah and, and and precisely on that note, that's kind of what I, I wanted to ask you. Um, let's say, and maybe this has happened to you, but let's just imagine, you know, that you've just finished playing, you know, maybe at, at a at a society gathering or something, and a young piper walks up to you and says, "I love what you do, and I want to do it." What advice do you give to that person? How does a, how does someone get into this? How do they get started? 
I, I usually ask them to either think of a tune, that, a, a very simple tune, that they can play without having to think about it, and then just simply la along to it initially, just la along to it in, 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 in melody. Um, and then gradually, again, you know, I, I do say to people, you do need to be somewhere where there isn't anybody else because you do need to be prepared to, to try things. Um, and then the next step, because oh, I've, I've done a few workshops um, yeah. for people piping and singing, and the next step really is to say, okay, now just stop it there, and instead of playing that note, just try playing a third above or a third or below, third mm. below but hold on to that, that note with your voice. Um, and and then we we, re, we replay it, and instead of playing that that you know melody note, I want them to play the, the harmony note at that point. And it's very small steps, um, and I think uh, you know uh, initially I used to say well, I don't understand why people can't do this, but, and I think mm -hmm. I, I was uh, that wasn't an arrogant attitude. It's just because, and I do think it come it's it really does stem from the fact I have been singing in choirs. For, you know, I had been singing in choirs for years. Yes, with I, lots of counter melodies around me, and yeah. it didn't phase me at all. And I think that. Um, I have to remember that people haven't had that experience. And so it's just very, very small steps. Just try every now introducing a harmony, you know, a harmony note initially. Mm -hmm. um, and then think about perhaps introducing a wee melody at the start of the song. So rather than just launching straight into the song, which if you'll notice with the recruited collier, there's no introductory introduction to that. That was my very first song, and I just launched straight into it yeah. with just a drone, and then I sang. Um, but since then, I've learned to play myself into a song. So just think about a wee, you know, a, a couple of lines of, of, of melody that could, even if it's the tune itself, just get you into the into the melody. Um, and then play around with that and see if you can change that a little bit and make it a little bit more interesting than yeah. just simply replicating the melody. So there's all sorts of tips, but I think th the main thing I would say to people is just try. Don't be frightened of it. Just mm -hmm. have a go. Um, and if you're trying to sing against a melody, uh, if you're trying to sing against a harmony note, just make sure that you hold your voice at that, at that note whilst you're playing the harmony note. Yeah. And try not to waver from it. Um, because I did find, you know, so, some people will often slip to the to the note that's being played on the on the pipes rather than oh, yeah. holding on to that's, that. That's absolutely the biggest challenge I have when trying to do this. My my voice wants to follow the chanter wherever it goes. Yes. But yes. part of that, like like you say, I think it's a fascinating insight that you're coming from a world soaked in choral music, where for me, I'm coming from a very bagpipe centric sort of view, and yes. so my focus is the yes. chanter. And learning to hear a counter melody is a kind of new thing for me. Yes, yeah. Um, but to keep working on it because I, it, it certainly is achievable. It's, you know, it's, and it's so rewarding when you do it, Jim. So mm -hmm. just keep working on that. And I think it's, it's, it's really exciting to also have one singer and one piper, you know, mm, um, absolutely. A, a piper accompanying a singer as well. Yeah. Um, yep, I've, I've forced my wife to do that with me a few times. <laughs> good. Yeah. Good. And and actually, she was relieved when I got a, a set of pipes that also had a key of A chanter because some of the stuff I was playing for, you know, in the, with my D chanter, often it's we were high. we were singing in the key of G, you know, and so it, it was yes. a bit high, and so she was relieved yes. when I got something a bit lower. <laughs> yes, I I have to use my A chanter. I can't. Yeah. I, I I have quite a low voice, and I find it quite difficult to <laughs> to get any higher. Yeah. I must admit, yeah. but. It's, it's worth persevering, it really is. It's a super experience. <laughs> <laughs>